Just, just before I get on to Italy, which is why we're all here, can I, I don't, some of you may know, there's a wonderful and exciting and highly amusing battle going on online right as we speak. Um, it was mentioned, a little jocular paragraph I wrote in The Spectator two weeks ago. Um, what, the first paragraph of that just mentioned Shakespeare authorship, and surprise, surprise, uh, in flew a massive uh, hornet's nest of uh, half-wits and demented goons, uh, furious, and in flew an even bigger hornet's nest of wonderful, um, and Stratfordians are highly intelligent, very, very clever lot. <laughs> who stung um, all the Lincoln poops very badly, but it hasn't stopped the Lincoln poops coming back. And the battle's going on, and it's becoming very, very amusing. Uh, what we've got on there, and any, I really welcome any of you, any keen on blogging, to get onto that site and just put in your Tuppany Higgins work, because it's very funny what's going on. Uh, we have people on the Stratfordian side, um, for instance, such as, Paul, I'll give you some names, you probably know who these people are, uh, um, David Kathman, um, someone called Tom Reedy, um, someone called Paul Edmondson, um, someone called Prosser, who is the communications director at Ontario, but, and this is the Stratford, Ontario, this is the big joke of the whole thing, is they're all using pseudonyms. And, and we've all worked out who they all are, so we're teasing them and running circles around them. And it's, it, it really is amusing, and they're being squashed and turned into jellies and lying flat on the ground. So, the last word I say about that, it's going on, it's live, it's happening, do please start blogging on there. And there's one other reason I'd like you to do that, is because The Spectator started off, when I put that little paragraph about Shakespeare authorship, they said, well, you know, I mean, this is a 400-year-old dead argument, isn't it? And it jolly well isn't, and, and, and that blog got 450 answers within the first five days, and The Spectator is, I can tell you, monitoring it very closely. They are now thinking of putting on a, 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 an authorship debate, um, and they, they might, if we suck up to them well enough, they're not going to take sides, but they might end up being a really useful forum and platform for some of the interesting stuff that we're discovering and finding. So please get on with that blog. Right, that leaves me about three and a half minutes to tell you about Shakespeare in Italy. Um, my interest in, in Shakespeare in Italy, I researched it, and uh, Hank is going to talk to you about Richard Rowe, and I suspect a lot of people in this room who are very knowledgeable, a lot more knowledgeable than I am, have already read Richard Rowe's book. My interest was to build on Rowe's work. Um, uh, I, I don't think everything that Rowe said was correct. Um, however, I think he, he, he set up a platform which is extremely interesting. I mean, his, his, I, I, would, I would think that his main objective was to destroy uh, the argument that Shakespeare sat at his desk and in England and imagined all these little details. So, as you know what he did, he rolled up his sleeves and off he went to Italy and started looking in and out of every single door and everywhere and finding these very extraordinary <coughs> correlations. So my interest in this subject was to build on Rowe and to look at what the essential argument is from the Stratfordian perspective um, of why Shakespeare didn't go to Italy. Now as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, because you keep saying more knowledgeable than I am, that there wasn't a problem with Stratfordians in Italy before. We all know that there are these missing years in Shakespeare's life, and among all the things that we've had to cram into there, or seen crammed into there, that he practiced as a lawyer, that he practiced as a teacher, that he learned all about medicine, that he learned five languages, one of those things he also did in that amazingly crammed period is he went to Italy, and that didn't seem to be a problem for a while. But of course, as we all know what's happened, is the authorship debate has heated up to such an extent that the Stratfordians have gone into sharp reverse. And so now it's quite impossible that he went to Italy. Of course he didn't go to Italy, don't be ridiculous. Um, and we know exactly how he got all his Italian details. And it's summed up very beautifully. It's the first and last time I'm going to praise Stanley Wells. <laughs> this particular occasion, he puts it in a very, very neat sentence, the whole of the Stratfordian argument. This is what he says in, in, in when he wrote for the stage. The anti-Stratfordians express astonishment that a man from Stratford could write plays set in Italy as if there were no books to read, no one to talk with, and as if the power of the imagination did not exist. So in other words, he is taking three arguments which he's junking together. You find some Stratfordians use only one. Some of them say, oh, uh, he just read it in books. Some uh, Stratfordians say, oh, he just got it all from a pub on the bank side. We make, if we've got time, we'll do that. But one of the greatest joys of my life was when I demolished that pub into five 
thousand little splinters. It's the biggest lot of rubbish that's ever existed. So some people say there was a pub on Bankside, very near the Globe, and Shakespeare popped in there and it was full of Italian clients. No, no, no. And the, the great joke of that is that he's supposed to have gone into this pub and from what um, an utter clown called Shapiro says, um, I a few choice conversations. This is a, I'm sorry if you don't think that's clown, you who went to. A, a few choice conversations is how Shapiro says the whole of Shakespeare's Italian knowledge came about. So he goes to a pub where there's some Italians, which there aren't, because anyway the pub's wrong, as I can explain <laughs> to you later. And the Italians give him enough information to write 106 scenes. Am I correct on that? Um, in fact, we've got a few figures here. Um, 106 scenes uh, it, uh, set in Italy, um, 800 general references to Italy, which are included in that, 400 references to Rome, 52 to Venice, 34 to Naples, 25 to Milan, 23 to Florence, 22 to Padua, and 20 to Verona, uh, 9 to Mantua, and one could go on with all those little places like Lisa Fusina and all these uh, different details. So that all came when he came from the Globe just down there, trotted down to the pub where there's some Italians, which by the way is a pub that is supposed to be called the Elephant. <laughs> it wasn't, it was called Elephant anyway, and that was in late 1598. Before that it was called the Red Heart. And the joke about how a lot of Italians is in there, I'll leave for you to discover, and this is a tiny bit of self-advertisement, because I wrote it up in, a, in, in an article in a book called Shakespeare Beyond Doubt. Mm -hmm. So let's just, let's, let's just have a look at, um, at, at some of these arguments. The argument from imagination, that I think is the, one of the three arguments that have been most totally destroyed. I mean, it, it, it's very, very difficult to say, um, I, I imagined a symphony and it went ba 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 bum because someone's going to say, well, you didn't actually, because if you go back to 1805, I think it was, um, you'll find Beethoven got there first. Now, similarly, if you're going to say Shakespeare sat at his desk and he imagined coming out of the door of somewhere in Florence and turning left and hitting a port, um, you're going to say, well, there's not much of imagination. He seems got it absolutely right. Now, where the Stratfordians, I think, have made the greatest bishops um, are in trying to force the idea of imagination. I'll just give you um, a couple of wonderfully ludicrous examples. So there's a fellow, I hope some of you have come across him, and I think he goes by the name of Doherty, and he wrote a book called The Ignorance of Shakespeare. Now, he gets onto the subject of uh, St. Peter's in Verona, which many, many of you will remember um, was the church in uh, Romeo and Juliet, mentioned where this, this marriage has happened, and he says this. There has never been a St. Peter's Church in Verona. There is a San Tommaso's, a San Stefano's, a Santa Anastasia's, etc. There is also a San Bernardino's Church with an attached Franciscan monastery. This would have been a suitable location for Friar Lawrence's cell. However, St. Peter's was as good a name for any church as any for Shakespeare. So in other words, Shakespeare just sat around and thought St. Peter's. Now, the fundamental difference, in my view, between the scholarly work that is being done by the anti-Stratfordians <coughs> and the scholarly work <coughs> joke, that is being done by the Stratfordians is whereby the Stratfordian will sit back in this utterly lazy way on his armchair and try and be a pundit and say there's no St. Peter's in Verona. The anti-Stratfordian, and in this particular instance, I'm talking particularly of Rowe, uh, Richard Rowe, goes to Verona, rolls up his sleeves, not to discover whether there's a church called St. Peter's in Verona, but to discover which of the four churches called St. Peter's in Verona <laughs> might be the one that Shakespeare was, was talking about. And Rowe, I think, has put a very, very good case forward um, to say particularly which that church actually was. Now, we had a very similar thing where, where a man called Benedict Hüttmann who wrote a very silly Stratfordian book called Shakespeare in Italy. And uh, you may remember that there's a proposed meeting between Shylock and Tubal to meet, meet you in the synagogue. And, and this very, very, very clever Stratfordian called Benedict Hurtman says, but surely there are no synagogues in, in, uh, <laughs> in, in Venice. Uh, and again, it's down to people like Rowe, who says which of the five synagogues <laughs> that were built between 1521 and 1589 could this possibly be? And he, he narrows it down to two, I think, with very good and very interesting evidence. So what I realized about the Stratfordians is, A, they're very, very lazy, and B, and I think this is a bad sin, they just copy each other, endlessly copying, copying. And in the case of Italy, they copied two people mainly. One of them is called Mario Praz, 
uh, who, funny enough, was an Italian, and uh, uh, and the other wasn't. I mean, he was just a man who wrote. Uh, can you remember Levith? He called Levith. And Levith and Praz become the Bibles for every single subsequent Stratfordian account of whether Shakespeare went to Italy based on the plays. Uh, Levith, by the way, copies a lot from Praz, so they're all copying each other anyway. And it's very funny and very babyish because you, you see these little remarks such as, um, oh, I was astonished to find that on a map of Milan that it seems to be somewhere called Gregory's Well, which is mentioned in Shakespeare. That's what Praz says. And then Levith, whatever, 20, 30 years later, saying, very surprising that on this map. Then Hertzman in, in, in 2011, absolutely extraordinary that on this map, they're just taking each other's sentences. Is any of them actually going to the map? to see if Gregory's well is on it that they're talking about? No, they're not, because it's not on it. So all you had to do is actually get out of the map, <laughs> instead of all being astonished 40, 50 years apart that this detail is on a map when it isn't. So one does really begin to despair of, of the way these people um, uh, 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 address this problem. Um, I've talked a little bit about Doherty. I suspect some of you have come across a fellow called <coughs> McRae. Um, Scott McRae, he calls himself, and he, he comes from a university called Purchase, which to me is, is, is a verb about buying things, but as an American you can perhaps yeah. explain there's something else behind that. Um, um, uh, Mr. McRae, or Professor McRae, wrote a book which he said ends for all time the Shakespeare authorship question. Now, as some of you I'm sure are aware, one of the Stratfordians of central tenet of Stratfordian argument as to why Shakespeare could not possibly have been to Italy was because Shakespeare said that you can go by ship, by sea, um, from Verona to Milan. I'm not even going to bother in front of you intelligent people here um, to explain that he didn't say that because you all know perfectly well he didn't say that. However, it's got a sort of cancerous crab-like movement and gone right around everywhere in the internet and Jonathan Bate and Schoenbaum and they're all repeating this. Um, so in Wade's, in Wade's Smarty Pants McRae, and he says, um, and he's talking about, this, this, why this whole argument is so absurd, because there was a Stratfordian clever, clever man called Sullivan, who in 1908 published um, a learned article about the waterways in northern Italy. And he used quotations going back from Pliny to Strabo to uh, heaven knows who, I mean, they're so well known, these waterways and canals, that it's almost embarrassing. But what, what Sullivan did in 1908 is the first time he brought it into the Shakespearean realm of argument. You know, before that, everybody knew it. There were just histories of canals. We know perfectly well that there were two canals linking Milan to the River Po, uh, one of them built in 1258 and one of them built in 14-something. It's just, it's just it's so babyish to try and deny it, but never mind, that, that's what's happened. The first time it came into the Shakespearean debate was in 1908 with this man called Sullivan. Uh, Sullivan <coughs> just laid it all out like it is. So along comes McRae in about 2010 and says he, that's Sullivan, claimed to discover waterways that connected the cities during the 1500s. Probably he was looking at German maps of the period that view Italy from the Alps and inaccurately show a maze of rivers. There is no archaeological evidence these waterways existed. Surely after only 400 years there would be some trace of them. Such canals are absurd. Now, I mean, you, you only have to go onto Google Earth, you can see all these canals, and I, I followed one that went exactly down from Legnano, down uh, straight across and joined onto the, on, onto the Po. They're, they're, they're still there. The, all the archaeology is still there. So this absolutely extraordinary man starts off saying probably he was looking at German maps. I mean, how can you criticize uh, a, a scholarly piece of writing by saying the conclusion is probably because he looked at a German map. <laughs> Did Sullivan produce this German map? No. Did Sullivan, uh, uh, was he aware, that, uh, does the German map, does the fact that there exists a German map with all these northern Italian waterways, does that not tell us something about the importance of the uh, Italian northern waterways at that time? Did McRae bother to read <laughs> Sullivan's essay? No. How do I know that? I'll tell you exactly how I know that, because the silly fool then went and criticised um, another piece from Prospero's a Line from the Tempest, where it said, at Milan they hurried us aboard a bark. Who should butt in on that but clever little Macrae? But Milan is not near any river that can carry a bark, he argues. Now, had he read the Sullivan piece, which he so 
keen to criticize, he would have noticed in that a quotation from <coughs> Montaigne from 1581, Travels in Italy, and I will tell you exactly what it is, it's an English, English translation. We crossed the river Naviglio, which was narrow, but still deep enough to carry great barks to Milan. So dear McRae, please, if you're watching this videotape, will you kindly read things before launching in like a baby and trying to club them to death? Um, now, the next thing, and I won't go on to all the different examples that I discovered um, of copying and of imagination. I'll give you a couple of examples of another little disease they all say, is if they say he didn't he didn't imagine, this is Shakespeare, that he didn't imagine these things about Italy straight out of their mind. They say what he did is he Englished them in a strange sort of way. And this is, I'll tell you a couple of these examples because they're things that I built up from Roe. Roe didn't, Roe didn't find these and uh, I'm sure he would have been absolutely delighted to them, uh, with them if he did. Um, so let's have a look at some of these uh, criticisms. So Praz, who is copied by Levith, who is copied by the whole lot, says, um, isn't it extraordinary uh, that in uh, the Merchant of Venice, we hear of a dish called a rasher on the coals. Now, rasher on the coals, they see, obviously means bacon, and bacon's such an English dish. How ridiculous that he's sitting in England talking about eggs and bacon, Shakespeare. And everybody copies it, and everybody says, yes, that's absolutely true. He can't possibly have been to, to Venice and think anyone would eat a rasher on the coals there. Um, I think it's quite easy to destroy this argument, actually. Um, what I did was I went to a very good dictionary, which you can now find online, um, by Florio, Italian dictionary, and start looking around and rootling about. Unfortunately, that dictionary only goes from Italian into English, so a bit of moderate knowledge of Italian is a help if you're going to try and look for, look for clues there. Um, and my argument here, a rasher uh, could be a thin cut of any meat, didn't have to be bacon, and besides, Renaissance Italians did eat bacon, which they called porcuto, that's the, the name that Florio gives for bacon, and a popular northern Italian dish of Shakespeare's days was called carbonata. And would you like to hear how Florio, in his Italian dictionary in 1598, defines carbonata? It is defined as meat broiled upon the coals, a rasher. Thank you very much. <laughs> Goodbye, <Brad. laughs> And then, of course, we have a, a, a really childish argument about an alehouse. How could Shakespeare say an alehouse in Milan? As we all know, the Italians are chiefly a nation of, of wine drinkers. Well, that may be so, um, but neither Praz nor Levith nor any of their followers acknowledges the simple fact that in Shakespeare's day, day, ale was the most popular alcoholic drink among the poorer classes throughout Europe, that the first Italian ale house was opened in the days of Agricola in the first century AD, <laughs> and that the world's first abbey brewery was at the Benedictine Monastery of Monte Cassino near Rome, and that John Florio gave two perfectly good Italian words for ale house in his 1598 dictionary, Hostaria and Hostarietta. Um, it is most unlikely that in Shakespeare's day you couldn't be served some beer in, in, in a city the size and international importance as Milan. Totally babyish. Uh, a colossal baby, Doherty, comes in now and says, says, oh yes, um, Shakespeare suggesting that, Mil uh, that uh, Verona had flint paving, uh, Doherty jumps in and says, oh well, I, I, I can prove that there was flint walls in Sussex and in Hereford and in Scotland um, at the time. That's presumably where Shakespeare got his idea about flint paving. Now, did Doherty bother to ask himself a very, very simple question, is there flint paving in Verona? You may, I mean, it seems an obvious question, but if we're discussing whether, whether he went to Verona or not, and of course there is, <coughs> flint was mined from prehistoric times in Verona, excuse me, and not only that, it became a huge export industry just after Shakespeare's time in Flintlocks, etc., etc. So again, um, boo to poor old uh, Doherty. Now, I'm running out of time, which is quite a good thing for you lot. Excellent. Shall I round up? Um, I, I, would like to, I would like to leave the Italian thing. All the things I'm saying here, it's not self-advertisement, it's just I know some of these things are quite interesting, and I know that I happen to be in front of an audience who would be very interested in some of the things that I came up with. So all these things are, in fact, in an essay I wrote in this book called Shakespeare Beyond Doubt, question um, mark, which was a book which we launched um, really to irritate the Cambridge University Press, who we discovered at bringing out a book called Shakespeare Beyond Doubt, and thought it would be very jolly to bring out a book with the exact same title within a month of it. Um, but we'll just put a question mark on it, <coughs> otherwise make the cover look quite similar. <laughs> so that, that was a bit of a sort of game, but I contributed an article 
<coughs> excuse me, on Shakespeare in Italy for that. So if, you're further, if you are further interested in some of the discoveries that I made there and building upon Roe, then, then, then it is all, all there. Um, I would just like to wrap up um, explaining very, very briefly, because it's now half past, um, my position, um, and that is that um, I'm not here, or anywhere in fact, I have no real interest in trying to persuade anybody to believe anything about Shakespeare or who he was. Um, I, I have my personal views, um, and, I'm, and, and, and I love researching it, but I'm not a, I'm not a proselytizer. I do, however, have a teeny weeny streak of pomposity in me, and, and, that, <laughs> and that, that teeny streak is uh, to do with education. And I know that you're doing fantastic work on that front, um, but it, it does sicken me slightly that um, our universities and our schools, by and large, are not open to the very, very simple fact that there is a serious authorship problem with Shakespeare. That's the only thing I'm interested in. That's the only thing I'm really <coughs> campaigning about. I had a wonderful conversation with a, with, with a, with a Neverlight today. I, I, I don't have to be a Neverlight, but I'm always... Any Andy Stratfordian is a friend of mine, and I'm very, very <laughs> interested in that. And thank you all for listening.